Hi everyone, welcome back to another lesson. This lesson is on tinnitus or tinnitus. So we're going to talk about conditions that are associated or cause tinnitus. We're also going to talk about the pathophysiology behind why tinnitus occurs. We're also going to talk about some other associated signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So tinnitus is a condition involving perceiving sounds in the absence of external auditory stimuli. And these sounds are often reminiscent of ringing in the ears. Now it's important to note that tinnitus is a symptom, not a disease. So it is a symptom of another underlying condition. There are actually two types of tinnitus. One type is known as subjective tinnitus, and this is actually the most common type. And the second type is objective tinnitus, and this is known as somatosound. This type of tinnitus is rare. We're gonna talk about these two types in more detail in the next slide and what are the common causes of each of them. Now let's talk about the epidemiology of tinnitus. A majority of people have experienced tinnitus at some point in their life. And the prevalence of tinnitus increases with increasing age. And we're going to talk about why that is later on in this lesson. Let's talk about the causes of tinnitus. So a lot of these are going to be causes and risk factors and associated conditions that lead to the symptom of tinnitus. As we mentioned before, there are two types of tinnitus, and this is going to be helpful in determining the risk factors and causes of each. So we're going to first talk about subjective tinnitus. Subjective tinnitus is a condition where the patient themselves is the only one to hear the ringing in their ears. There is a large list of causes of subjective tinnitus. One of them is exposures to loud noises. So exposures to loud noises, especially for long periods of time, can lead to damage in the hair cells in the ear or the cochlea of the ear, and this can lead to issues with tinnitus. Age-related hearing loss is another common cause. This is also known as presbycusis. So these are going to be the most common causes, exposures to loud noises and age-related hearing loss. Some other causes include otitis media with effusion, so middle ear infection, Certain nutrient deficiencies like zinc deficiency and vitamin A deficiency are possible causes of subjective tinnitus. Certain medications, particularly NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or Advil, aspirin use, and antihypertensives can also cause subjective tinnitus to occur. We can also see subjective tinnitus in certain medical conditions. Meniere's disease is one of those. We can also see it with migraine headaches. So this can occur with migraine headaches with auras. And we can also see it in meningitis patients as well. Certain head traumas or head injuries can lead to a subjective tinnitus. We can also see this occurring with multiple sclerosis. Hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism can also lead to tinnitus as well, or subjective tinnitus. Certain psychiatric conditions like anxiety and depression can increase the likelihood of someone having subjective tinnitus. We can see hyperlipidemia or high levels of lipids in the blood. And certain dental conditions can also cause subjective tinnitus as well. Now, Objective tinnitus is the other condition. This is also known as somatosound. Some clinicians may only describe this as somatosound and may not actually state that this is tinnitus because this type of tinnitus, this objective tinnitus, can be heard by others. Now you might be wondering, how does this happen? So in certain cases, if there is certain changes to blood flow in the head, this can actually be heard by a clinician. So the sound that is experienced by the patient may also be heard by others. The most common cause of objective tinnitus is benign intracranial hypertension, but we can also see objective tinnitus occurring with aneurysms, arteriovenous malformations or AVMs, and arterial bruise and venous hums can cause objective tinnitus as well. So we can see it with carotid stenosis, so a condition where the carotid arteries become stenotic due to plaque. This can cause objective tinnitus to occur as well. So those are some of the causes of objective tinnitus. We're not going to talk about objective tinnitus much in this lesson. Again, objective tinnitus is also known as somatosound, and oftentimes clinicians may describe this as a separate condition. So we're going to focus mostly on subjective tinnitus. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology of tinnitus. So the pathophysiology of tinnitus, there are actually multiple theories as to what might be going on in tinnitus. Some of the theories include the following features. There is damage to auditory receptors within the cochlea of the ear. So this is one common feature among theories of why tinnitus develops. There's damage to auditory receptors within the cochlea of the ear. Again, this can be due to things like loud noises over long periods of time. And another feature that may be found in some theories as to why tinnitus occurs is 
the feature of having abnormal neuronal activity within the auditory pathway of the brain. So not only does it appear that the hair cells or the auditory receptors of the cochlea, not only does it appear that they are affected, but there may also be some abnormal neuronal activity within the brain as well. So abnormal neuronal activity within the auditory pathway of the brain may also be a cause as well. And then there may also be some other parts of the brain that are activated when they shouldn't be. And these include the limbic structures that are involved in emotions like anxiety. So these are some of the common features among multiple theories as to why tinnitus may be occurring. So now let's talk about tinnitus and some other associated signs and symptoms. So tinnitus, as we mentioned before, is ringing in the ears. So it's often described as a white noise. It can also be described as buzzing, hissing, roaring, metallic grinding, wind blowing, and other types of auditory sounds. And in some cases, these sounds may be altered or induced by certain movements. In the case that that does occur, this is known as somatic tinnitus. So some of these movements can include jaw clenching, so clenching your jaw or changing eye position or moving your neck in certain ways. These can all alter or induce ringing in the ears. And if that's the case, this is known as somatic tinnitus. Now, it's also interesting to note that ringing in the ears may be louder when first waking up in the morning and or the ringing in the ears or the tinnitus may decrease when sleeping. So because of these features, it doesn't seem that damage to the auditory receptors in the ear are the only cause of tinnitus. It seems that there are other causes, and we talked about some of those causes being abnormal activity within certain brain areas. So this seems to lend credence to that idea. And there are actually some triggers of tinnitus as well. Some of these include emotional or physiological stress. This also lends credence to the idea that certain areas of the brain are abnormally active. Noises can also trigger tinnitus as well. And certain bodily symptoms like neck strain or other muscular issues can cause or worsen tinnitus symptoms. Now, there are some other associated symptoms of tinnitus. These include hearing loss. We mentioned before that age-related hearing loss is a common cause of tinnitus. And this hearing loss is more specifically referred to as sensory neural hearing loss. Tinnitus can also cause or induce annoyance and anxiety. Tinnitus can also cause issues with falling asleep, so insomnia. Difficulty concentrating can also be a problem with tinnitus as well. And in some cases, vertigo may occur. If we see vertigo being something that's associated with tinnitus, this may be due to a migraine headache. So there may be an underlying condition that is tying these symptoms together. Otalgia, so ear pain, or otorrhea, so purulent drainage of the ear. These, again, would signify that tinnitus is associated with these symptoms due to another underlying condition, perhaps otitis media with effusion. So again, these are some associated symptoms of tinnitus. So how do clinicians diagnose and treat tinnitus? As I mentioned before, tinnitus is a symptom, not a disease. So it is a symptom of some other condition. Now, if a patient does have ringing in their ears, that is enough to say that they have tinnitus. That is a clinical diagnosis. But again, tinnitus may occur in the context of another medical condition. Again, we mentioned a lot of those before. Now, treatment is going to relate to the underlying medical condition that is causing the tinnitus. So it's going to depend on that underlying cause. But it's also important to avoid exacerbating factors. And some of these include the following. Loud noises. We mentioned before that loud noises can be a trigger to having tinnitus. We also mentioned emotional or physiological stress and some other bodily symptoms like muscle aches and pains, these may exacerbate or induce tinnitus symptoms. Smoking has been also linked to worsening of tinnitus. And there's a question of whether caffeine use induces or worsens tinnitus. In the past, it was believed to be a cause of tinnitus, but new research and new evidence suggests that this is not the case. So it doesn't appear that caffeine use is related to tinnitus symptoms, but I just want to mention that here. Cognitive behavioral therapy is another way for patients to deal with their tinnitus. So if you want more information on cognitive behavioral therapy, please check out my lesson on that topic. Sound and music therapy is another way that patients may try to treat their tinnitus. So using certain frequencies of sound may help patients essentially fatigue those active neurons in their brain to allow the patient to reduce the sound of the tinnitus. 
or certain music or certain songs may be used in a way that allows the patient to not hear the tinnitus. And then some other therapies include going out into nature and hearing sounds of nature that may help the patient distract from the sound of tinnitus as well. Now, it's important to note that neck massages may also help with tinnitus symptoms. So this relates to what we talked about before, some of those bodily symptoms that may trigger tinnitus symptoms, neck pain and some other muscular or bodily pain that may be triggering tinnitus. So neck massages may also help with tinnitus symptoms. And then in other cases, pharmacotherapies may be beneficial, and these include benzodiazepines. So clonazepam can be used, and this has also been shown to help reduce tinnitus. And then TCA antidepressants like amitriptyline may also be used to also help with tinnitus as well. So these medications have been shown to reduce tinnitus, but only when taking the medication. So as soon as a patient stops taking the medication, their tinnitus often returns. So if you want to learn more about other ear, nose, and throat medical conditions, please check out my ear, nose, and throat medical conditions playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.